Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Ellen. Um, in fact, I was thinking that uh, after this introduction, I can only do damage to my paper and to the chances of you reading it uh, in the magazine. She um, abstracted just the good things out of it. Um, <clears throat> I don't have much new to say for the audience here, uh, <clears throat> since I see most of you every day. <clears throat> but um, I'd like to say a few things by which to initiate a discussion, because here today we have a fantastic opportunity. We have people coming from computer research, people coming from architectural research to discuss a topic that actually depends on both, and uh, where these as a relationship at the moment um, have only a fragile uh, beginning. Um, <clears throat> as um, Darren suggested, our program in uh, Environment and Energy Studies has been going on for quite some time. In fact, I joined it as a student in the mid-1970s and it continues and in fact has expanded very considerably, as you know, over the last few years. And in this time, we uh, have looked at, at a number of buildings all over the world. In fact, as you see there, um, <clears throat> just over the last five years, we have undertaken some 300 research projects in something like 60 different cities, 50 different countries, and many different climates, with the intention of looking at ways by which using the concept I um, titled here adaptive architecturing, we are able to create an autonomy uh, from mechanical systems and um, <clears throat> introduce a new sort of approach to architecture. <clears throat> I have um, uh, unusually try to write some notes uh, with the intention of reading them because I thought, well, I do want to say something that makes sense, more sense than just flipping slides, but it's not my style to read the notes, so I, um, I'll just keep them there. So I was um, <clears throat> saying that we have looked at a number of different buildings and uh, <clears throat> over the last few years, we have systematized this look into, into something more methodical, something that would allow us to learn from these buildings, to create a diagnostic by which we can read the environmental attributes and assess the performance, and then using the inputs or the outputs from, the, from those uh, readings as inputs to calibrate computer software, which we then use in design research. And this has worked uh, very well, and I'll quickly illustrate this process uh, through a project of this year. So this is a, a building that was studied by our students um, <clears throat> as part of the um, <clears throat> first term studies that we do in build building studies, which um, constitute a vehicle for learning the, the principles and uh, tools of sustainable environmental design. It's a building a complex which is very near here, which as you can see consists of mixed uses, including housing, and um, <clears throat> which claims to introduce solar radiation into its site, which uh, is confirmed by this uh, picture which I've taken a few days ago, and um, which is also illustrated here by the simulations undertaken by the students. This is more or less the uh, condition of the day when I took the picture. And um, we proceed, therefore, in the study of observation of what the building looks like and what is claimed about it and measurement and conversion of the measurement into calibrated simulation. This year we extended into looking at outdoor spaces. Here you see uh, measurements taken um, in late October 
um, measurements involving different variables, their temperatures, surface temperatures, lux readings, um, the wind velocities, and uh, the interpretation then of those measurements and of the experience of, um, of people around the site um, in terms of comfort. And um, inside the building, looking at individual uh, units, dwellings, taking measurements there of both temperatures and lux levels, which can then allow us uh, to calibrate the computer model here. I think the, uh, um, the green line represents the measurements and the blue line, sorry, the green line represents the simulation and the blue line, the measurements that were taken. And um, even the difference in the fluctuation becomes quite significant in the sense that the fluctuation shown by um, <clears throat> the simulated temperatures is an indication of the rather artificial way by which we have to introduce data into the simulation. So in this way, we study both the relationship between reality and simulation, uh, but also the way in which making the simulation more real, or in any case, its discrepancy from reality. And here then, uh, the, 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 the first attempt at looking at whether that building can be made independent from uh, mechanical space heating uh, in winter. You see the um, outdoor temperature at <coughs> taking values here that are very typical of uh, London climate in midwinter. And incrementally, the different strategies that are being tested, which are described here, the very simple strategies, allow us eventually to get into the comfort zone, which is shown here in green. And the <coughs> mechanical space heating dropping now to close to nothing. <coughs> And then the findings from this study, uh, which is um, slightly more <coughs> um, detailed than what I have showed, the findings of this study then becoming the starting points for design research, which in this case has um, led uh, the same team into the development of a scheme uh, on another site uh, nearby, uh, which you see here. So this is a process, and in this process there are also questions which I shall try to bring forward um, in a little while. Our explorations of uh, these buildings um, has taken us through buildings that include traditional as well as contemporary, and also some well-known buildings like this one, Robin Hood Gardens, uh, where our approach has revealed very interesting things, both, for example, the ingenuity of the architects in the way in which, sorry, in, in the way in which they created this uh, environment, bringing together of the different variants of the dwellings, and the environmental issue that this created, uh, which I, I'm not sure they were aware of, which is that in this complex bringing together, it made the envelope of the building be far more exposed to the outside than it would have been otherwise. And thereby, in those days where there was no thermal insulation whatsoever, uh, the building uh, was not performing very well environmentally. That's <coughs> part of the diagnostic of this approach. And here, another uh, well-known building where um, you can see the, a series of strategies being investigated by students, and as the, uh, the heat loss rate of the building uh, is reduced as a result of those, then its space heating energy drops more or less linearly, which is a very interesting observation in itself, in the fact that by incrementalizing certain changes, uh, we can almost linearize the energy savings thereby we can put that into a mathematical formula and uh, allow ourselves um, <coughs> to do the research faster. And these measurements uh, taken 
on the site of the High Court in Shantigarh as part of a um, master's dissertation um, then become the basis for modeling uh, <coughs> on a software which is called Envy Method to allow us to um, <coughs> simulate outdoor conditions as they are influenced by buildings and vegetation. So we can observe straight away that the, the temperatures predicted here are very similar to those that had been measured in the equivalent spots, which then allow the student to be able to discuss the building environmentally in the way in which the different elements that Le Corbusier had introduced into the building as well as on site, uh, their effect on the environmental performance. So through this process of building and urban studies outdoors and in transitional areas between, between the buildings, uh, we have come to see and begun to understand what the principles are by which architectural and urban design can be used as a tool for environmental comfort that we do not need to be dependent on mechanical systems and on engineering that, however, we do need to bring people in the equation. And um, this is one of my favorite, all-time favorite slides, where you can see that there is architecture and there is environment and there is people, and all three contribute to each other. So saying that, we have begun to understand the principles by which we can do this and create environmental conditions which are not just quantitatively uh, positive in the sense of creating a comfort zone and people will either forget about the environment um, or answer that they're happy with it, but conditions which we can recognize in qualitative terms as environmental quality, not just as a quantity, not just as a saving. Now this very modest uh, group of uh, semi-detached houses uh, which were constructed in the early 1980s precisely to be very unassuming yet very low energy. A measured annual space heating energy was 5 kilowatt hours per square meter in uh, 1985. So nearly 30 years ago. That's 5 kilowatt hours per square meter is close to zero space heating compared to what at the time uh, would have been a typical 100 kilowatt hours per square meter for new buildings, new housing that were insulated, let's say, to the um, UK building regulations of that time. So already close to 30 years ago, we had this as, as I said, unassuming, but yet uh, very clearly uh, researched in detail. Well, we can do that today. We can do that today on any new residential building. In fact, on any building in London and by extension in many other locations and many different climates. Now here just um, recorded the sort of um, space heating demand that um, <clears throat> results from a building that is going to be kept within a certain comfort zone uh, over the year in London as being between 10 and 30 watts per square meter. And then similarly by estimating the, the potential for uh, solar gain in that building and the potential from free heat gains that are released into it through its occupancy, a similar number bring these numbers together. Of course, when we bring these together, when we infuse some life into the building, it starts operating, it would well be that the heat demand is of 30, whereas the free heat is of 10, or vice versa. And therefore, the key question is that once these 
two sets of numbers are seen as being related to each other, then how can we make it that they always match each other, so that the energy balance is always to our favour, in fact, to the favour of the occupants, i.e. that at, at all time the comfort conditions and the environmental quality that they seek uh, is achieved. Well, it is this that I called adaptive architecture. Well, first of all, we need to know where uh, the occupants are likely to be and when and what kind of activities they're likely to be engaged in and what sort of demands do these activities have to keep the occupants in comfort and what sort of loads they generate. And then we need to address the variability of the building of the building envelope that will allow them to stay in comfort, uh, achieving an energy balance which will be varied but at all times match so that we stay in comfort. So I call this eco-biological attunement, so eco <coughs> for context, for place, biological for occupancy. And essentially it is about, um, with techniques which are really very simple, for the building to have a variable rate of transmission of heat and light and the controllable air exchange, aiming at the balance that we will call a free running, i.e. no mechanical input. And then bringing the occupants now through what we call adaptive opportunities, they adapt and the range of comfort conditions is quite broad and can be broadened even further by themselves. They know how to do it. It's a matter of us being able to support and help them. So we call these adaptive opportunities for occupants to be able to vary the building properties so as to regulate the environmental conditions. And finally, the building in its context. And there we look for symbiotic urbanism with other buildings and outdoor spaces. So very quickly to illustrate this concept, this is from another project, I think last year's project, which uh, was to <coughs> design a farmhouse uh, outside Santiago de Con Compostela in the north of Spain. And it shows hour by hour the sort of anticipation of where the occupants and extended family here and, uh, uh, and the animals, where will they be at every moment in time? And, and seeing that in fact parts of the dwelling will be completely empty at times and others will be much more densely occupied and then transitional spaces which uh, are not necessarily very easy to identify here, opening or closing at, at different times as the use develops. I um, was observing this building in Barcelona from my hotel room uh, and um, found it a perfect um, example of non-attunement but a very good illustration of the concept of attunement. It's like, you know, you wish to peel it off uh, <coughs> and, um, and be able to maintain that peel at different positions in order to expose more or less of the envelope and in fact at some point push it back and close it. Um, the building in itself of course is very clearly tuned, does not want to be attuned by me or to be variable. It has been tuned in this particular position and um, I think for two architectural reasons. One is so that I couldn't see what's happening in it from my hotel room, so privacy and the other is that there is much more interest on the street which is there than on the street which is there. But in doing so, of course, it froze itself. And uh, this is the difference between adaptive architecturing and pre-adaptive architecturing. Pre-adaptive architecturing wants the form to be static, frozen. Adaptive architecturing, by definition, wants a build wants a building and an architect who are willing to have the form variable. Maybe just a little, 
uh, sort of emulate the, the daily cycle, the opening and closing of shutters, for example, uh, or the seasonal cycle, the operation of solar control devices, uh, for example. And this does not need to be more dramatic than that. In fact, many of our simulations have shown that this in itself is quite enough. The, the, there is an assumption in some places, especially perhaps in work environments, that the occupants should not touch anything, that everything should happen automatically. This does not apply to domestic environments. And so I think with housing, people are prepared to accept, even here, that there may be things that they need to move. Uh, in fact, around the Mediterranean, if a building does not have shutters, um, then it's, it's, it's not a house. And, um, and everybody, from the grandmothers to the young children, will know when, how to operate them. And, and then the next question is, how much variability do they offer? In this case, in this particular case, I think we have quite a lot of variability with these louvers and with the shape and with the movements that can be um, <coughs> adopted from complete closure to a wide range of openness. And then the symbiotic urbanism. Well, buildings at this moment are giant space heaters for the urban environment. This is what they do. Whether you're heating them or cooling them, mechanically, they chuck the heat to the city and to each other. And that in itself makes the urban environment incredibly unpredictable environmentally. You might be using the most complex software, but you wouldn't have a clue what the climate is in there, because it becomes totally unpredictable with these exchanges that take place in addition to the natural forces, which is the sun and the wind that operate within the urban environment and are very drastically modified by uh, the geometry. And so intervening in there, and here we just see a scheme that uh, picks up on the roofs of buildings and uh, in fact, joins the roofs of several buildings which otherwise would have separate roofs that would look like junkyards. <clears throat> Whether it's possible is another um, question. It's desirable. And I refer to the tradition, and, and perhaps what we're doing has affinity with the tradition, that traditional architecture was both symbiotic and variable. In, in small ways, but important ways. So that these shutters, which uh, might have been internal or external, and these windows can undertake all these uh, functions at different times or combined. And so now, I'm very close to the end and to the questions that I uh, mentioned that I wish to identify and hopefully discuss. Um, <clears throat> that um, <clears throat> I would like to start by uh, raising the question of design tools that uh, we need today for uh, this ecological design research in, in, in architecture. We want to be able to predict environmental conditions at the design stage, to do it quickly, maybe even, in my opinion, to predict before design so that by the time we start design we know what to expect and we know what it is that we're trying to do. And then <clears throat> as we proceed with our design project, we want to be able to modify the design parameters so as to improve or fine tune the performance that will result. So we need specialist knowledge and experience. It is not possible today to deal with environmental matters without some knowledge and experience. Because so many aspects of environmental design are actually counterintuitive. And we need perhaps computational tools for form generation. These are increasingly popular and 
computation tools for performance simulation. And perhaps these can be uh, joined in the future. Well, they are not in the present. And so, to start with, we have poor correspondence between generative and simulation and environmental simulation tools, mm -hmm. which are considered to be quite problematic uh, because generative tools are very attractive to use, whereas environmental simulation tools are not necessarily so. So, a student would prefer the former to the latter and uh, will create nice pictures, but not necessarily performative buildings. And both require knowledge and experience, which it is very easy to forget, because when you have this luring interface, then you forget that there are questions which needed to be answered with knowledge. When we look at the environmental simulation tools, the kind of tools that we use in our program, which um, include separate dynamic thermal simulation as a separate package, daylighting as a separate package, airflow and computational fluid dynamics as separate packages, outdoor simulation as separate packages. When we look at this, we see a fragmentation, which of course is problematic. <coughs> and then, despite that, there are still a number of uh, physical processes that designers might be interested to address that are not covered. And um, the occupant behavior and the resulting comfort conditions are poorly modeled. The software has been developed for machines so that if you apply your air conditioning and your space heating systems, then this will occur, but not for people. But we want the people. And then, in terms of the calibration that I mentioned in the very beginning, we have a problem in the sense that unless we do it ourselves, there isn't enough information today, as we had in the past, to verify the performance claims made by others on new building projects. Others whose projects will be liked by students and will be emulated on the assumption that perhaps they will have performed very well because this is what was claimed at some stage for them and different journals and different presentations. It's impossible to verify and um, not enough data is given either. And um, very often, uh, buildings today start to communicate environmentally, so it looks environmental, but is it? And so, <clears throat> the role of education becomes quite critical, and uh, feedback uh, to software developers, I think, is very important. And uh, thank you.